Welcome, my dear students. We are here to discuss the module which is on histamine and antihistamines. We'll have a brief introduction of the receptors on which histamine acts. It acts mainly on the H1 and H2 receptors. And the effects on H2 receptors most of the times are the noxious effects. The H1 receptors are responsible for the smooth muscle contraction and the bronchospasm, increased vascular permeability and edema, increase in the secretions, there's the mucus and the salivary secretions, vasodilation due to the release of the EDRF and nitric oxide and leading to hypertension. There's also a triple response which is popularly known as heel flare and flush. These are the effects of the H1 stimulation. The H2 receptors are involved in the secretion of gastric hydrochloric acid. Histamine liberation happens in response to the venoms that is insect and reptile bites, food products like crabs, lobsters and fish, trauma due to cold, chemical, thermal or radiant energy, antigen antibody reactions and various drugs. I hope you remember D-tubocuridine or skeletal muscle relaxin is known to release histamine and this is why the adverse effect of D-tubocuridine becomes hypertension and precipitation of bronchial asthma. So also morphine, pethidine, that's meperidine and amphetamine are known to liberate histamine. What are the antihistamines? When we are calling them antihistamines, we are meaning to say these, these are the competitive blockers of histamine receptors. And we discuss about the histamine receptors. Let's first think about the H1 blockers. The drugs are going to competitively block the H1 receptors. Let me tell you something. Whenever you say antihistamine, traditionally it means H1 antihistamines. The older agents are called classical antihistamines or older agents or traditional antihistamines. And there is a trend to call this generation 1 antihistamines. The newer antihistamines are called second generation agents and they are supposed to have comparatively less sedating effects. The second group of drugs which are going to block the receptors are the H2 blockers which are going to block the H2 receptors associated with the gastric acid secretion. And these drugs are cymatidine, ranitidine, famotidine, nizatidine, so on and so forth. Let's come to discussion of H1 blockers, the older, classical, traditional or generation 1 antihistamines. We classify them in various ways. One of the ways of classifying them is depending on the sedation and the potency. The first group is most sedative and potent antihistamines. A standardized dose for many of these drugs is 25 to 50 milligrams. And this includes, you can have a look at the examples in the slide, diphenhydramine, diaminhydrinate, promethazine, and hydroxyzine. I have written some brand names in front of it, not to advertise, but just to give you a rough idea, because you might have used many of these drugs like Benadryl expectorant or Atarax tablet. So this would give you a visual impression which drugs I am speaking about. So it's diphenhydramine, diaminhydrinate, promethazine and hydroxyzine. The second group is moderate sedative and moderate potent. And on this group, as you see on this slide, you have phenyramine, antazolin, cyproheptadine, meclizine and buclizine. Just a reminder, this cyproheptadine, which appears at place number 3 on this slide, also has a 5-HT2 blocking property. It's also an anti-serotonin agent. The third group is mild sedative and less potent. And you have chlorpheniramine, you have dimethindone, mebhydrolene, and clemastine. So that's regarding generation 1. Now we move on to generation 2, which are supposed to be the newer antihistamine agents. These drugs are mainly used for the purposes of allergic conditions. And the drugs include astimizole, cetirzin, azelastin, terfinadine, loratidine, desloratidine, and fexofenadine. 
If you look at this slide, I have underlined loratadine, desloratadine, and fixofenadine because these are supposed to be the most commonly used agents from the newer antihistamines. The reason is they have at least sedating properties. The drug which is mentioned just before these three drugs is terfenadine was at one upon, once upon a time used very frequently but proved to be cardiotoxic and that's why the use was stopped and the drug was withdrawn from the market in many countries. Also the first drug on this particular slide that's astimizol was proved to be cardiotoxic and it was withdrawn. As I was saying the second generation of newer drugs whatever we mention until now they are used for mainly anti-allergic uses and for the other uses of antihistamine whereas in the second generation we have some drugs we who have anti-vertigo and anti-migraine effects and we must mention two drugs number one is cinarizine and the second one is flunarizine so that's about the second generation or the newer antihistamines now let's consider the actions of the antihistamine number one is obviously the antagonism of histamine these drugs are able to inhibit the triple response, aging, edema, urticaria, and the secretions. They have got anti-allergic effect. They can suppress the cough. That's anti tussic effect. Many of them have got anticholinergic action. And this action is like atropine. So we say they have atropine-like effect. Many of them also have got alpha blocking property. And some of them have 5 hydroxytryptamine blocking property. These drugs also have anti-emetic effect, they have anti-motion sickness and anti-migraine effect and some of them have anti-Parkinsonian effects, that's the mainly anti-cholinergic type of antihistamines. What are going to be the adverse effects? The adverse effects I am dividing into those which are common to older and newer antihistamines and those who are present only with particular group. Firstly. The adverse effects which are common to the older and newer are the anticholinergic adverse effects because many of them have got atropin-like effects. So there will be dryness of mouth, retention of urine, hesitancy, constipation and blurriness of vision. They are the classical anti-muscaronic adverse effect. If these drugs are taken in large amount, it can lead to acute overdose and is likely to lead to tremors, convulsions and fall in the blood pressure. Because these drugs have got atropine-like effect, to manage the overdose, we need to give physostigmine, which is an anticholinesterase agent. It's more useful because it crosses the blood-brain barrier and is able to reverse the atropine-like adverse effects of these drugs. Now we come to the adverse effects of those drugs, which are the older antihistamines. So now the adverse effects only seen with older antihistamine. The reason is these are able to cross the blood brain barrier and this is why you see some central nervous system adverse effect. What is it? Have you ever taken an older antihistamine? As soon as you take an older antihistamine you start feeling drowsy and that's why it's central nervous system depression. There is sedation, decreased alertness and concentration, motor incoordination, and impairment of the psychomotor performance. That's very important about the older antihistamine because they are central nervous system depressants. Skillful acts will get affected and you need to be especially careful while prescribing these drugs to the persons who are vehicle drivers or the machine operators. The on long term administration H1 antihistamine produces increased appetite and weight gain. It also produces 5-HD blockade and that's another reason. But it's a classical effect of blocking H1 receptors in the CNS that there is increased appetite, the patient starts eating more and there is weight gain. Synergism with the CNS depressants will be an important drug interaction. Because these drugs are CNS depressants, if you take these drugs with other CNS depressants, namely alcohol, sedative hypnotics, on narcotic analgesics, you are likely to have additive CNS toxicity and this could be dangerous. As I said, some drugs have got a capacity to block the alpha receptors, so you are likely to have hypertension. These effects are minimal 
with the newer agents for a simple reason that their penetration across the blood brain barrier is comparatively less. So older antihistamines mostly produce the effects which are related to the central nervous system. The newer agents do not cross the blood brain barrier significantly and this is why you don't have these adverse effects with the newer agents. What are the therapeutic uses? These drugs are used in the symptomatic management of many many conditions. For example, the first group is allergic disorders, many allergic disorders. It's used for symptomatic relief of cough and calm cold. It could be used in the symptomatic relief of vomiting. They are used in the management of motion sickness. Many of them are used. But I want you to remember Promethazine Chlorothiophilinate, a very typical name. Promethazine Chlorothiophilinate can prevent the motion sickness. They are used as sedative, hypnotic and anxiolytic, especially in the condition of pre-anesthetic medication. I hope you have heard of Promethazine, which is a very valuable drug to prevent the post-operative and the perioperative vomiting. So that's pre-anesthetic medication. These drugs have got atropine-like effects and they are useful in treating the drug-induced dystonias or drug-induced Parkinson disease because most of the antihistamines are atropine substitutes. What I would advise you is go back to your chapter of atropine, that's the cholinergic blockers, and have a look at the atropine substitutes useful in Parkinson. This is going to be a very useful revision to you and then come to this topic and read the names of the drugs. That will be very nice to know the drugs used for drug-induced Parkinson. The names are Benzexal, Benztropin, that is trihexylphenidyl, cycrimine, procyclidine, bipyridine, and also diphenhydramine. The next use is vertigo and migraine in case of drugs like cinerizine and flunarizine. And a rare use is to produce hypothermia during surgery. A mixture of promethazine, chlorpromazine, and pethidine could be used as light cocktail to decrease the body temperature during surgery. The uses of newer or second generation antihistamine is same like anti-allergic uses for all allergic conditions, whatever we said. And just a reminder to you, the least sedating newer second generation antihistamines are fexofenadine, loratadine and tesloratadine. These drugs have got anti-vertigo and anti-migraine effects and also anti-5-HT action. Weak calcium channel blocking properties have been noticed with flunarizin and cinerizin. That's why we already said these drugs are useful in vertigo, migraine and mania disease. So that is the discussion about H1 blockers. And now we go to H2 blockers. The purpose here is not to discuss the gastrointestinal system, but just to give you a brief introduction of what are going to be H2 blockers. H2 blockers are mostly associated with the gastric acid secretion and they inhibit all phases of gastric acid secretion. You go back to your physiology, there's basal phase, psychic phase, neurogenic phase and gastric phase of gastric acid secretion. Since they inhibit all the phases, they are useful to decrease the gastric acid secretion and may be useful symptomatically in management of many diseases associated with this gastric acid secretion, namely gastric ulcer, duodenal ulcer, stress ulcers, gastritis, zollinger ellison syndrome, and gastroesophageal reflux disease. To name a few, I'm first mentioning cimetidine, which was an older agent, is outdated now, but just to have a background of what is H2 blockers, it was used in the dose of 200 milligrams three times a day and 400 milligrams at bedtime in the symptomatic management of peptic ulcer. Cimetidine, I'm saying an older agent, was less potent, had short duration of effect, it inhibited the hepatic microsomal enzymes, that cytochrome P450 enzyme system. So you remember cimetidine as an important example of inhibitor. It used to bind to the androgen receptor leading to the sexual adverse effects like gynecomastia, galacturia, impotence and decreased sperm count. It also used to lead to central nervous system adverse effects and alcohol intolerance. What we've already discussed as diselfram-like effect 
if you go to your general pharmacology module. So that's about the older agent, cymetidine. Now we have newer H2 blockers and they've got many advantages. Number one, they're more potent. Number two, they're long acting. You don't have to give them three times or four times a day. There is no inhibition of the hepatic microsomal enzyme system. I have written it as HMES or what you call a cytochrome P450 enzyme system. There are no anti-androgenic adverse effects with the newer H2 blockers. And the central nervous system adverse effects, A oblique E adverse effects, are quite infrequent. But still, the newer H2 blockers do produce alcohol intolerance by inhibiting the alcohol metabolism. What, what does it mean? It means when you are receiving an H2 blocker, maybe an older or a newer agent, the patient should not consume alcohol. Otherwise, it's going to get the effect which is like diacylfiram like effect. The newer agents include ranitidine, which is a long-acting agent. Initially, it could be used in the dose of 150 mg two times a day and later for maintenance, just 150 mg HS, that's horasomni, at bedtime. And the second agent is famotidine and the third agent is nazatidine. So what we discussed on this module, a short module, was the antihistamine drugs, the H1 blockers and the H2 blockers. Let's keep aside H2 blockers, which are the components of the gastrointestinal system and we'll be discussing them again when we come to the gastrointestinal system. But what was important from this module was the H1 blockers divided into the older or classical and the newer or less sedating antihistamines. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed this module and will also be useful to you. Thanks.